Okay, everyone, welcome to this week's edition of our BDPA Tech and Career Talks. Uh, we are glad to have Tom and Megan with us from Blue Granite, closing out our three-part series on data and analytics put on by Blue Granite. So looking forward to hearing what they have to share with us today about a day in the life of a data scientist and data engineer. Uh, again, I am Devin Jenkins. I work at, with GE Healthcare in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as a senior technical product manager in our supply chain digital technology organization. Uh, and I lead our national BDPA Tech and Career Talks and I'm excited to have you. Uh, in case you're not familiar with BDPA, BDPA is Black Data Processing Associates. Uh, the organization was started in 1975 with a mission to transform careers from the classroom to the boardroom. Uh, so we have a focus around teaching young people computer programming skills, and then also serving as a forum for IT professionals in the industry to network and continue to develop their skills and their careers. Uh, so glad to have you with us today. Uh, I will get into a brief bio of Tom and Megan, and then I will turn the floor over to them so that they can share what they have for us today. Uh, so we'll start with Megan. Uh, so Megan Quinn has expertise in statistical analysis and machine learning, as well as statistical theory. Her recent focus has been centered on predict predictive maintenance for military fleets with a background in education research as well. Uh, she is knowledgeable in a variety of analytical tools, including Python, Spark, R, and SQL. Uh, so we're glad to have Megan with us. And we also have Tom. Uh, Tom is a data scientist and business economist specializing in data analytics and machine learning for industrial settings. His background experience is in nonprofits and education. Tom holds a bachelor's in social entrepreneurship from John Carroll University, an MBA from Willing Jesuit University, and is finishing a PhD in applied economics from Western Michigan University with his dissertation entitled Applied Macroeconomics and Business Intelligence in the Digital Age. Now, so we're excited to hear from Megan and Tom today. At this time, I will turn the floor over to you all so you can share with us what you have today. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction there. Uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, so today we're going to be going over a day in the life of a data engineer and data scientist. So I'm going to be specifically covering the data engineer side and my colleague Tom is going to be covering the data scientist side. So personal introduction about me. Um, I have my bachelor's in mathematics from Wake Forest University and a master's in statistics from UNC Chapel Hill. I've been in consulting for close to five years now and at Blue Granite for close to three years. Um, some of my favorite projects and ones I've found the most interesting that I've worked on. Um, for my graduate thesis, I did a GLM model to obtain key factors and primary grade students test scores. So predicting um, based on factors of a teacher's experience, because I don't know if a lot of you are familiar, teachers have to go through these certifications, these, these exams. Um, does that really impact a student's teaching or is it more about their passion, where they've come from? So it was a really interesting study. And then my previous job, I worked as a, um, for a government contractor and we did predictive maintenance for F-35 fleets. So it was really cool getting to go out, predict whether a landing gear is going to fail or not based on usage, where, and the location of the Air Force Base. And then at Blue Granite, I've done a lot of recommendation ALS modeling for um, different things, such as like home search sites. So looking at Google Analytics data coming in, um, determining what people are doing on the internet based off their clicking and pass down that and recommending what they should look like. So kind of thinking like, in a Zillow type term, when you see a house and you get a recommendation because of everything you've looked at beforehand. And then also clustering analysis on insurance purchasing activities. So kind of the same idea. It's like these type of people are most likely to purchase this type of insurance because they have similar patterns and similar traits. So like I said, I'm gonna be talking about data engineering, but full disclosure, I'm not actually a trained data engineer. My background is as a statistician and into data scientists. So I'm gonna be approaching the topic of data engineering as how I use it as a data scientist. So it might not be if you go talk to someone who is degreed in a data engineering field, they'll know it 100% better than I do. All my colleagues have taught me so much in data engineering, so that's where I've gotten it from. But um, 
it is actually the backbone of modeling and analytics. I mean, the saying is garbage in, garbage out. And it is very true. If you do not have good data, or if you don't even know where your data is, a lot of companies I've worked with, I've consulted with, like, yeah, AI sounds amazing, but we don't have data. Obviously, you can't build a model from nothing. So it's all about getting the data, structuring it in a way that you can obtain it easily, query from it, and put it in a model. So that's also my office space beam. Everybody loves that movie. Um, so data engineering overview. What exactly is it when I say data engineering? No, we're not getting out there and building bridges, even though technically we are in a computer. But um, the goal is basically building and maintaining an organization's data pipeline system. So what that means is you usually have the data coming in from a million different sources. You need to find a way to collect all those sources into a maintainable pipeline, whether that means like storing them on primary keys, getting their associations, and then storing them in some kind of data lake, data warehouse, where you can then access it and query it, but you do know where it came from and what it means. And then also, again, part of that is just being able to clean up these data sets into full usable forms. So as a data scientist, when I get data, if it's not in like a structured model, like input output form, I'm not gonna be able to use it. So a lot of cleaning, wrangling, making sure it's not duplicates, making sure it's not bad data, goes into key features of it. And there are different types of data. Um, so structured is probably what you most are used to seeing. Think of an Excel sheet, quantitative, stored, easily renderable, can pull it up in a text file, Excel, read it in. Unstructured is a little more difficult. It's usually when data is just stored in its native format. So think of like pictures coming from Google or a stream coming from audio. Um, those are get challenging to work with. A lot of times those are stored in like a data lake structure or in a blob storage in their raw format. So they can be later be parsed by other types of engines. And then to lay out where a data engineer fits in this process, because there are so many different terms for this world of um, AI and machine learning. So software engineers, they're basically kind of the ones that like help us get that data. They're the ones that develop these apps to either track the data, get the data. And then data engineers get that data that they have provided. We process it. We put a governance on it, which is just making sure like security, making sure it's coming in where we think it is, where it's going. We wrangle it into a way that we can then give it to data scientists who go through your models, your visualizations, um, writing these reports. So that's where data engineering kind of fits in on the overall. Um, some of the tools I use a lot in my day-to-day -day job uh, as far as transformation. And by that, I mean, when you read in a data set, how are you gonna get it into that pretty storage for a data scientist to use? So I use a lot of Python, uh, Spark, SQL, and Azure Data Factory, which is just kind of a system of pipelines. And I have an example later of that. And then as far as storage, uh, Azure Data Lake, that's kind of the storage we use a lot of the times. And it's really good for the unstructured data, as I was saying, because you can just put it in there how it is. You don't have to worry about, as an SQL, if you're familiar, having to have primary keys, everything linking. And then also, for as far as storage, you have cloud-based versus on-prem. Um, a lot of our jobs and a lot of the times we've been hired on is somebody has something on-prem, but they want to move it to the cloud, whether that be they've run out of room, they need more space, and then cloud is just the way of the future, the way everything is going now. So it's also a lot of our projects. So now I'm just gonna go through a few examples that I've used and been through. So this example is just going from a data model to a actual machine learning model. So a key feature of data engineering is creating what's called a data model. And all this means is like having a plan, just planning out your data, how are you gonna line it up? So in this example, it was looking at Google Analytics data um, Looking at Google Analytics data coming in, and then we had these three external data sets that we want to tie to this Google Analytics data. So we're looking at communities, plans, and home specifications, um, and joining that to Google Analytics. So this is just kind of outline of how we plan that out and how we plan these joins. And then, so this is just a screenshot of some Databricks code, just to give you an idea. It's like what does it mean when I say this? What does this look like? 
Um, the first is what the Google Analytics data looks like. She, as you can see, it comes in in this really nested JSON type looking format. As a data scientist, if someone just handed this to me, I was like, run a model. That is impossible in this format. You cannot just put in, um, say like, hey, I wanna predict the continent based off the hits. Let me put that in exactly how it is. That's not gonna work. So the job of the data engineer, get it from step A to step B, nice and row by row. So it's something that we can predict. And then once we have that, we finally get to a recommendation model. So we're able to put all that data in and then recommend based off other models that they have or other sites they've looked at what we should recommend them doing. So just an example of a simple model here. And then the next example is just um, a classic data updates. So a lot of times um, companies will just have uh, data tables that data is constantly coming in and needs to be updated. This doesn't mean it needs to be overwritten, over um, saved every single time. They just need to do like a merge insert. insert. So for this example, we're in Azure Data Lake Storage. We copy in the files there. We perform necessary transformations within the data and then we write it back out to the Azure Data Lake storage. So that's the model part of it. And then kind of looking at the code part, you'd basically do a match. So if the data rows, the new ones coming in, match ones that are existing, don't do anything. But if based on this primary key, when they don't match, then rewrite over it. So just a simple merge into upsert statement. And then finally, this was um, an example of a Databricks pipeline that I was talking about earlier. So kind of like your stereotypical lift and shift. You have data in one location, but you wanna get it to another location for performance, for query accessibility, whatever it may be. Data factory is a really good way to do this. So this is just a simple example of copying from an SQL server to blob storage. And as you can see, like Data Factory, if you haven't worked with it, it's pretty user friendly. It's a lot of just kind of point and click and making sure you have your connections. So obviously this one's simple, but it can build up into like pretty complex ones. So getting data, you can have if then conditions, you can copy data to two places, you can delete it, and then finally move it to your uh, final storage place. So that's all I have on my end. I'll um, pass it to Tom now so he can go over data science. Sounds great. Let me start sharing. There we go. Are you seeing that nice and well, Megan? Yeah, looks good. Great. All right. Uh, well, I am Tom Wynandy, a data scientist at Blue Granite and working with Megan, who's wonderful. Um, and what I'm talking about now is just what I do on the data science side. Um, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about and confusion about like what a data scientist is and what we do. And that's, that's common. Um, and that's because it's such a new field. So here's just a, I snagged a Google trend of what uh, data science searches are and data engineer searches have been in the past 10 years. And as you can see, uh, our jobs didn't exist a decade ago. Like this is a really new area and um, yeah, and so data science, it like kind of grew, it's more popular than data engineering for the moment, but I think data engineering is going to be growing more than data science in the next couple of years. Um, but because it's such a new area, there's, yeah, just a, a lot, um, there's confusion around it and a, a, not much formalization between different organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, but these jobs, they're a byproduct of the digital age and the fact that there's all these new advances in technology going around us. So when I talk about the digital age, um, it's really three key technologies that have driven this and have made our jobs possible. Uh, and those include big data, low cost compute and modern analytics. Uh, for example, uh, every 42 minutes, so before this talk is over, there's going to be five exabytes of data created and stored. And that's equivalent to all human uh, communication uh, ever, ever given. So people talking for all of human history is going to occur in the same volume of data in just 42 minutes. Then there's low cost commute or compute. So every 18 to 24 months, 
the number of transistors on a dense integrated circuit is doubling, doubling every year and a half to two years. And you probably know this as Moore's law. And then with modern analytics, the CEO of Google himself uh, said that he thinks AI is going to be more profound than electricity or fire. And so the convergence of these technologies have created this explosion of data of computing power that can process and store it and analytics to analyze it, um, making data science and data engineering possible. And because it's so new, there's also, we come from a lot of different backgrounds, um, but there's really some key areas in which we all share our experience in. Uh, so if you ever ask, look up a definition of data science, they're, they're not very consistent, but this Venn diagram uh, generally is. Uh, and it shows that data science, it's an interdisciplinary field that's kind of coming at the convergence of three areas, computer science, statistics, and then domain or business knowledge. And so we're the, at the intersection of those three areas. Um, so some of these bullet points I already talked about, uh, the job is completely new. Uh, and we also come from a variety of backgrounds because if the job didn't exist a decade ago, then university programs and data science didn't exist then either. And that's starting to change, but until that becomes more formalized, you're going to have people like Megan and I that are coming from very different directions. So my own background is economics and Megan talked about how her background is more um, math and statistics, but we all ended up at the same place. Um, and then the job description of a data science, data scientist varies a lot by organization as well. Uh, some places they have more, you're, when you're just doing data analysis, uh, much more like traditional statistics or business intelligence, but other places you're very much more heavy on the machine learning, um, uh, oh yeah, just on machine learning and managing these models. So it varies a lot. And if you're interested in applying to one of these jobs, you should dig into the job description to see if what they're actually saying is data science is data science. Uh, and then finally, uh, communication is also um, possibly the most important part of what we do as well. And this probably fits in with the domain and business knowledge, but because we're data scientists, the last step of the scientific method is communicating your results. And I can't effectively do my job if I can't explain what the models are doing, why they're behaving in a certain way, and what are the implications of that for the business and solving that business problem. So communication is very important to the job of a data science a scientist as well. Um, but let's talk about machine learning too. So machine learning, um, it's, it's kind of a grown from traditional statistics, but it's still different in an important way. Uh, so traditional statistics, it starts with some statistical model that's uh, supposed to be used uh, to make predictions. And then uh, they'll collect data, usually smaller amounts than machine learning, but they'll collect data and um, yeah, to, to be able to kind of fit the model and make predictions from there. But they're starting with the model and then using data leading to results. Machine learning kind of reverses that order of the first two steps. Machine learning starts with the data. And then instead of just fitting that to an individual model, it'll test out many, many different models. And it'll use the data to identify what model is making the best predictions. So then once it has the ideal model in mind, that's when we'll go ahead and start collecting results for what that model is predicting. So it's a different order, and that's the key distinction of what machine learning is. Now, another big trend in machine learning is starting to automate this process. Uh, so automated machine learning, it's a way to kind of take out the tedious part of machine learning and do it in a very, uh, be able to experiment in rapid succession. So consider an example where we're trying to predict the price of a car. And we have to, we want to understand what is a car worth. Now, in a more traditional way, we have to, uh, as data scientists, we would identify, okay, which features are going to predict how a car is behaving? What is the algorithm we're going to use? 
um, even if we're testing out all these different algorithms, maybe we're testing different parameters on those algorithms. And a parameter, you can think of it just as a knob that you turn that makes the algorithm behave in a different way. So then in order to see how good is our model at predicting, what we're doing is that we select the features, an individual algorithm, uh, adjust those parameters, and we'll get an outcome of the model. So this is some like accuracy score of how good the model is at predicting the worth of a car. And we will then save that and maybe try a different algorithm or a different set of parameters. And that comes with a different accuracy score. And then we'll have to save that. And this is a very tedious process. And we have to go through one by one trying these different things. Um, the benefit of something like automated machine learning is that it takes that process and as the name implies, automates it. So now the input is just data, what we're using to, def or yeah, what data we're using to train and test the model, uh, the defined goal or objective function. In this case, it's predicting the price of a car and then applying specific constraints, like saying, I only want you to spend an hour testing out different combinations. And auto machine learning will intelligently test those different combinations of features, parameters, algorithms, and identify what is the best model out of all of those. So, so that's uh, automated machine learning. It's becoming more and more common in different machine learning settings. Uh, and I've been spending more time personally with, the auto with automated machine learning. However, there still are customized models that I'll build. But either way, there are some different ethical implications about what I need to keep in mind for those models. So many people, they'll blame the model or blame the algorithm for behaving in a particular way. And in general, like, yeah, you shouldn't have any, you shouldn't have too much faith in an algorithm or uh, the person who built that algorithm. And instead you should be able to audit that to understand, okay, what's going on behind the scenes. And one of the big trends in machine learning now is to understand the interpretability of different models or algorithms. You might've heard, heard the term black box being used, which it describes an algorithm that cannot be interpreted, but that's not necessarily true. There are new methods about working around and identifying what are the features or what are the variables that are predicting why an algorithm is behaving in a particular way. Uh, for example, in a webinar I gave a few months back, uh, I built a model to predict which individuals should be accepted or rejected on a loan application. And if someone comes into a bank is rejected for a loan, they're going to ask why they were rejected. And if the model isn't interpretable or I don't spend time looking at the interpretability, then they're just going to leave even asking just a reasonable question. So in this, uh, in this chart here, I was able to identify which features were the most important in predicting whether an individual would be accepted or rejected for an application. And I could also look at the individual level and say, for this person, what were the red flags on their application that caused the algorithm to, to predict that they would default on that loan? Now, another trend is to make sure that the algorithms are fair and uh, the the challenge with this is that if you're using training data to build an algorithm, if that training data is biased, you're going to have an algorithm that's biased. For example, if you're trying to predict which CEOs are successful, if you're using historical data, you're going to find that white male heterosexual CEOs are successful. And that's not because any of those characteristics are important. It's just because that's the historical data that your model was trained on. So you do have to do careful auditing to make sure that uh, specific groups are not unfairly treated within an algorithm. And this is the concept of fairness. Uh, some headlines in this came up this, uh, in the past summer where a lot of the big tech firms identified that their facial recognition algorithms were biased for particular minority groups. And so they um, prevented police, um, yeah, police forces from using that facial recognition uh, technology. So there is some important work being done in this area, but a lot more that needs to be done in um, making sure the, uh, the models are interpretable and fair. 
And finally, I'll just uh, highlight a few projects I've worked on the past year to kind of see, again, what the day in the life of a data scientist is. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite ones was with some coworkers, we built a recommendation engine for grocery items. So we took, uh, we found a grocer and scraped all their data online and then used that data to say, okay, if they're out of a particular item, what is the most similar item in the store to that missing item? Uh, for example, uh, Jif Natural Creamy Peanut Butter. What is the most similar item on their website uh, for that product if they run out? And it was, it was pretty good. Uh, so the top two suggestions you can see that the algorithm predicted uh, was low sodium creamy peanut butter and then crunchy, both of the same brand. So that was entertaining. And then uh, Megan and I worked together on a project with the FDA. We participated in a COVID challenge where we tried to predict which were the features of patients uh, that would that identified whether or not they would be hospitalized and for how long. And so we were able to uh, I use medical history and those medical records to look at which were the most at-risk patients based on their symptoms. And then finally, Megan and I just finished a hackathon with Microsoft, um, specifically looking at uh, Internet of Things devices. So we used a dev kit of theirs called Percept, and uh, it had a dev kit on it, a camera, and a microphone. And we were able to build a model that uh, was able to just scan my street and be able to, to correctly label cars and trucks, people and dogs that were walking by or passing on the street. Uh, this screenshot uh, is actually just one I found online. Uh, we're not able to actually share any of our results uh, yet from that. But it was a similar outcome where we were predicting which objects were in an individual image in real time. So if you're interested in data science and wanting to pursue a career in this area, it uh, doesn't matter your background, there is a way to kind of find yourself into the field. But what I recommend that you kind of, what skills you develop to get there is definitely coding. You need to be able to like work with programming languages. Uh, the big three are still Python, R, and SQL. And then bonus points if you have Spark in your CV as well. But data is also getting more complicated as Megan explained. So the more you can work with complicated data, the better off you're going to be. And then cloud computing is also very important for the future of data science work. Uh, most of the models I build now are all existing and running on the cloud. And then finally, there's ML ops or machine learning operations, which is tracking and, and uh, yeah, maintaining a machine learning model over its entire life cycle, like making sure that when data changes, that it's being able to update and it's not behaving in any inappropriate ways. So these are some skills that are very important if you are seeking to pursue uh, a job in data science. And then if you wanna learn more, uh, we do have a blog and YouTube channel. You can just find it by searching online uh, where we talk about different projects we've worked on or different areas. Um, and you can see some content here that Megan and I have developed. And then finally, if you do have more specific questions, please reach out to us, uh, connect with us. We would love to be able to answer your questions uh, both now, but if you're watching a recorded version of this, uh, feel free to email us or uh, my LinkedIn information is here. So definitely connect with me online as well. Uh, but with that, we do want to thank you for attending or watching. And I guess we'll field questions now. Yeah, uh, I looks was like we had a few pop up. Um, yep. One question was there are new tools coming out daily and it's hard to keep up with them. What are some foundational technical skills that will help make these learning easier? I'm going to take your you first. Take, okay. <laughs> yeah, take, take that, Megan. Um, um, I in, definitely, I, I definitely agree with your last PowerPoint. You kind of went over as far as um, coding. Uh, I'm biased. I like Python, but I think as long as you have one of them, um, coding's kind of like learning a foreign language, but once you establish some things, like even though I am not like a hundred percent proficient in SQL, because I have a background in Python, you learn how to read it. So you just learn how to get better at reading. If, even if you're not, you have to Google half of it, which I mean, we all do. Nobody knows every single piece of code by memory. So it does help having at least one where you learn how to read code. Do you want to 
take your shot, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the Venn diagram of being able to know like computer science, including coding, um, basic statistics is so important. Like I, I, I did not enjoy the linear algebra class I took, um, <laughs> but it is so valuable to what I do. Um, so yeah, just the, the core competencies and then just a willingness to learn because this area is always going to be changing because it's based on technology, which is always changing. So a willingness to learn new things is necessary. That's, then that, that ties into the second question I see here in the chat. Uh, what are the most important areas of math and statistics? Which is more important? And then they included Bayesian statistics, calculus, linear, linear algebra, et cetera. There, can we say all of them? <laughs> yeah. So in my opinion, uh, um, yes, they, they are all very important. You do need to have an understanding of the basics of them. Um, but in terms of calculus, you you might be able to get by without without a lot of calculus, uh, but definitely knowing like multivariate calculus and then just the fundamentals of like rates of change, uh, that's that's important to understanding and interpreting different models. Uh, linear algebra, you do need to understand the basics of that, but then statistics might be the most important. Megan, you were the math major. You, I should let you ask that one, answer that one. <laughs> no, I mean, as far as I agree, um, calculus, um, you don't apply it a whole lot besides like understanding multivariate type scenarios. Um, linear algebra, I agree with you, Tom. That was not a fun class. And then events probability, probably my most hated class ever. Um, don't take it. Just kidding. If you're into it, take it. But as far as like what we do, I think just having a basic understanding of statistics, like Tom mentioned, with machine learning, with the growing of this, a lot of the discussion now is like, well, isn't your job going to just go away? Computers can build these models. Yeah, I mean, I am not sitting down here solving for these models, doing it by hand anymore. But the key thing is that when I run the model, I know what the parameters are supposed to be. I know how it's supposed to um, output. Like, I know how to explain it. So I think that is the key job for a data scientist is not being able to figure out code. There's always going to be some kind of resource for helping with coding, but understanding what you're coding is the key. And that's also um, because we're the ones communicating those things. Like we have to be able to explain the model, even if a computer built it, we, mm -hmm. we have to say, okay, this is why it's important for the business, or this is what the outcome actually means. That's good. Uh, we have one more question, and then I see Paul has a question as well. Uh, so the question before I get to Paul, what are the differences between AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and how are they related? Yes. Okay. So um, you can think of like just three circles inside each other. Let's let's use a donut because I because I'm hungry right now. Um, so the like outermost edge of the donut is that it's all AI, which is just any kind of like computer program that um, mimics uh, human decision making and thinking. Um, and that can also include like if then programming or like you can, I don't make a computer program that can play tic-tac-toe. It's not machine learning, but it's still AI. And then within AI, so think of the icing on the donut, that's um, machine learning. So it's all AI, but that's Kind of programming those specific prediction outcomes, predicting a numerical variable or a categorical variable, some of the examples I gave in the talk. And then deep learning is like the donut hole, and that's uh, specifically uh, neural networks. So much more complicated things like um, uh, if you have an Amazon Alexa at home, and hopefully I just triggered it right now, that's <laughs> using deep learning, those neural networks to be able to identify speech recognition. Yeah, I agree. I was, I like your donut scenario better, but I was going to say, I think of it as an umbrella, all encompassing AI mm -hmm. to machine learning to neural. Okay. Uh, Paul, so I see you had a question. Do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, 
appreciate you guys taking the time out to to do this. Um, and I uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to ask experts in the field about something that I'm recently walking out, and that's um, this uh, idea of going to a a data science boot camp. Um, not sure if you are familiar with them or have come across them, but um, yeah, my situation is just the the timeline and the cost just works out for me. Um, I have a, a master's in engineering and I served 10 years in the military and I'm looking, I'm very much interested in getting into the data science field. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned already, I recently completed a data science fellowship um, for four months. So I felt like the next step that would really help would be a, a boot camp like this. I see the reviews and they, they look good. And um, I just feel like um, the, the, the timeline, the cost fits for me, but yeah. So I wasn't sure if you had any insight in regards to that. Yeah. I mean, I think me personally, I'm a very um, tactile, hands-on learner. So if it's a boot, boot camp that provides, you know, here's some data that you can like actually build a model with, provide you a platform, whether it's they might have a Databricks setup cluster for you or just a plain Python Jupyter notebook. Um, I think the more experience you have, the more comfortable you are with handling data, interpreting it, the better you'll be. Because there's a lot, I mean, I know it's like reading a textbook and reading articles. Um, you can understand it, but I think like the real learning comes from when you get to practice it. And I know a lot of the boot camps are good about giving you those practice scenarios. And yeah, to, to add on that, Megan, I, I think it's also important to be able to share those results. So if you're applying to data science jobs, you should absolutely have a GitHub page where you share your code and different projects that you have worked on. Um, I, I would be skeptical of anyone that's applying to a data science job and is only like submitting a paper resume without showing me any code they've written. But, um, but no, I've, uh, I've heard good things about boot camps. I don't have any firsthand experience, um, but I think something like having an engineering background is that you have the quantitative skills, you understand how to program specific things. So you're, um, that's more of just a, uh, like just a lateral step to like, okay, you have all these like fundamental understandings. You just need to be able to apply it to this new area, maybe a new computer language and solving new problems. So I think, yeah, I think that's that's a good way of doing it. Um, and as I said in my presentation, like people come to data science from a lot of different backgrounds. Mine's economics and which like, I don't know, isn't immediately have to do with anything of data science, except that it's just also under, or having the base understanding of quantitative concepts and applying it to different areas. And to add on to what Tom just said about coming from different areas, I think that is like really important and kind of what makes our field unique. It's like, even though, I mean, people think, well, math is numbers, numbers is numbers, but in machine learning and statistics, it is a lot about kind of thinking outside the box. Like, how are we going to predict this? Why are we trying to predict this? What are we asking? Like, what, how could we interpret this? So like having people from all these different fields who think in a different way, like I think that's what's really gonna make the field unique and set us apart. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that insight. And uh, yeah, it's uh, encouraging that uh, maybe I'm on the right track. <laughs> <Appreciate laughs> it definitely that. sounds like you are. Mm -hmm. great, yeah, great. and uh, let's connect on LinkedIn. If you have follow-up questions, definitely let me know, Paul. Yeah, and <laughs> feel free to shoot me an email. Awesome. Outstanding. Thanks, guys. Sure. Okay. Thanks for that question, Paul. Uh, we're here coming up on time. Uh, so again, thank you to Tom and Megan uh, for sharing with us today. Uh, and thank you for the questions that were asked. Again, the recording will be made available on our website, uh, bdpa.org backslash tech in career talks. Uh, I will put that in the chat, bdpa.org backslash tech in career talks. I'll put the actual link in there, <laughs> but uh, that that will take you, you put that in your browser, that will take you to our career talk webpage. Uh, this will be on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, so be sure to go check that out. 
uh, if you want to see this or any of our other previous talks. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with our next speaker. Uh, our Q2 focus will be around cloud. Uh, so this concludes our data and analytics series. Dig again, a uh, huge thanks to Blue Granite uh, for sharing with us over these last three sessions, our series around data and analytics. Uh, this has been awesome. Um, and we hope to continue to have you join our sessions going forward. Um, and hopefully some career opportunities come out of this for some of our attendees. I uh, know that's another goal of this. We want to make sure people are aware of opportunities available to them and extend opportunities to them from our partners like Blue Granite. Uh, so thank you for having us, uh, for being with us. Um, and then we will hear from Lila Jones uh, of Google Cloud in our next talk. So should be an exciting session. Uh, again, enjoy your weekends, enjoy your time until next time, stay safe. And thanks again for joining. Thanks, Take care, everyone. everyone.